Hello everyone, we have got a super ex exciting stream today because we're going to give you behind the scenes of how I work with my clients. So we're going to give you a bit of context in how we got connected, even I can't remember, so I hope Denise or Peter who will join us shortly will remember that. And then we can talk about how we work together and how we delivered some results and you know we're retrospective so what they liked what they didn't being completely open and honest uh, we haven't scripted this at all so it's going to be a lot of new information for me and you know me i love being transparent but before we get started let's give a shout out to jason g was first so thank you so much for joining the live stream uh, SMK and Carl as well. And Carl has been doing some work on uh, some of our open source projects using data stacks, which is really interesting. So hopefully we get time at the end oh, and we great. can talk about that too. So I have the awesome Denise with me and let me do, you know, I won't give Denise uh, an intro of justice. So let me just let's pass on to Denise. Denise, please give yourself an intro. Hey, Eddie. It's uh, so great to be here on another live stream. Um, and by the way, before we get into intros, when we were doing the countdown, I took like a meta photo of behind the scenes, behind the scenes, uh, because the setup that you have is quite impressive. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm really excited to just kind of peel the curtain back and uh, share with everyone how we got connected. And um, yeah, so uh, I'm Denise. I, uh, I have a PhD in computer science focusing on machine learning. I've been working in the tech space and, you know, for almost 15 years now, primarily focusing on graph databases and graph data. And I think that is most relevant for this discussion is kind of the journey of how I got here and my first career, because uh, I feel like that experience is most relevant, Eddie, into how I found you. Awesome. Oh, that sounds exciting. I look forward to uh, hearing that myself. Yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. So, um, do you want me to dive in? Yeah, you know what? Let's just dive straight in. And while you're doing that, I'm going to share this on uh, on socials as well. Yeah, great. Yeah, so um, Eddie, I, don't, I know I didn't ever really tell you about this, but um, so my first uh, my first passion, and actually a passion I continue to have with me, is that I love teaching and building with other people, and just kind of seeing that moment when someone else gets this cool idea that you think is really cool as well. Because of that, my first career actually was as a as a teacher. Uh, here in the United States, I taught uh, I taught high school mathematics for a year right when I graduated uh, undergrad. And let's just say I was steamrolled like completely flat <laughs> when I was a high school teacher. I was way too young. Um, I had such a passion for the subjects, but just an inability to really uh, I mean, I just I was too concerned about my students liking me, right? Instead of being like a good teacher. <laughs> I think probably a lot of people fall into that, I guess, as well. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know. So I always was really into teaching and making lesson plans and, and understanding the learner's experience. Uh, but for, you know, at the first uh, career steps for me personally, it just wasn't fit for me to be a teacher uh, to get started. Uh, so I went on to get a master's in mathematics, a PhD in computer science. There was a lot of additional teaching and, you know, TA ships and, uh, you know, made some new classes for the University of Tennessee when I was there, because it's always been a passion of mine to teach. But uh, it's just, it, I just realized that that experience really is what just drew me to working with you and, and some of the things I learned on that journey uh, that made our collaboration so fun and, and potentially different. And... I love that story, how, how you got into tech. And I think it's so interesting because there's so many ways for people to get into tech, which I think is is awesome. Um, I'm loving the uh, the shout outs in chat. Everyone say hi to Denise. I will share Denise's um, Twitter links in a moment. And also you can see straight from the beginning, people were getting really, really excited to uh, join the live, live stream. So awesome. how did you do discover me did we go via a third party if i remember correctly uh we uh i, I was watching your video oh, okay <laughs> okay so that's good um, to know so if i may ask a question then um so a lot of people in my audience we're encouraging them to create content and more document their journey share what they're learning 
So what, mm-hmm. what stood out with my content, I suppose? So what could others do to make their content stand out so people can discover them or potential clients can discover them as well? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Eddie. And the, the exact thing that I, that I found was your teaching style. When I was following your videos and watching you code, just the way that you were verbally explaining and the pace at which your code was um, being written for the idea that, that you were building, it was just, it was exactly how I personally like to learn. And I find it to be a, I mean, well, that's the, that's the medium usually that attracts learners to YouTube, right? Like you're going to want to have more of a visual audio experience. That's why you're on YouTube trying to learn. And uh, I, you know, when I was watching your videos, also watching Anya Kubau's videos, that you guys just both had a cadence of teaching that I really liked. And so that's how I found your videos and really enjoyed them. Um, so that was the answer to your question. How I found your videos actually uh, is that at, uh, at DataStax, we were starting a new focus or a new project on trying to do full stack, full app development for the, the open source data stack that we're building over here at, uh, at data stacks. And I'm completely new to this space, Eddie. So like, I'm kind of your same audience member. I didn't know any JavaScript. It was a brand new language, but I knew all these super things about graph data and machine learning, but I didn't know how to write JavaScript. Uh, so that was the, that was how I found you via YouTube. I was personally wanting to learn, uh, and then just, you know, kind of hopped into your series and it was, it was very fun. Awesome. Um, that's so good to hear. It's always nice to get positive feedback, but we are going to get into the retro stuff later where you can give me the constructive feedback so I can improve because I think that's really, really important as well. Um, and let me think. So I'm trying not to jump too far ahead. I get really excited sometimes and I jump far ahead. So everyone watching. Don't we all? Don't we all? Because <laughs> we're passionate about what we do. And I think, you know, that's what we share in common with a lot of people um, here in chat as well. By the way, everyone in chat, give the video a thumbs up. And I will share Denise's Twitter now if you want to go follow Denise and see what Denise is up to. If you have any questions, ask as we go along, put a queue in front, so hopefully I don't miss it. If I do miss it, then just copy and paste it again. If they're on a different topic, I will probably bring those in later on, but as if it's what we're talking about, then we'll bring it in now as well. Awesome. Uh, yes, Peter is the third speaker, but we're waiting. Oh, I have a message from Peter. Oh, Peter's joined. Okay, I see Peter over that side. Awesome, okay. So <laughs> hey, been... Peter, good morning. Sorry, little internet difficulties this morning. Uh, can you hear me at all? We can. All is good. Great. It's uh, it wouldn't be a live stream without technical issues. So you know, it's perfectly <laughs> normal. I'm glad it was you, not me, this time. So that's good. Sorry awesome. about that. Yeah, yeah. No worries. Well, we just started, and we were talking a bit about Denise and and what she thought of my content and how how she discovered me. So maybe we'll jump straight to to Peter. And uh, Peter, if you could give yourself an intro, and while you're doing that, I'll bring your details on the screen and share your Twitter link in the chat. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, so hey, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Peter Humphrey. I'm a uh, product manager at Datastax. Um, I've been working in Java and middleware for a good, gosh, good 20 years now. And, uh, <laughs> you know, mostly with developers uh, throughout my entire career. Uh, I used to work at, uh, used to be the, used to work a lot with the Spring ecosystem. Uh, I was the, uh, worked with the Spring team for almost a good seven years. So I've done a lot of Java and middleware uh, and I'm, I'm kind of exploring data now. I've done a lot of app dev in my life. So uh, I've been wanting to work on data and I, I worked at Elastic a couple of years ago and now at, uh, at DataStax where I'm trying to learn about cloud native data and help developers succeed with Apache Cassandra. Awesome. I'm just going yeah, to shift my... Oh, and just sorry, a, I was just going to jump in there to say, like, that's why I love working with Peter. Uh, so, Peter, the, the context you missed is I kind of gave myself, like, the inverse intro, right? Like, I've been working for with, with data for 10 to 15 years, and I was brand new to app dev, and that's how I found my way to Eddie with wanting to learn JavaScript and app dev. Uh, and that's why, you know, we make such a great complementary team, because we kind of have different uh, different approaches to being at the same spot. No doubt. No doubt. 
Oh, I love that. You're right. Having the different kind of points of views and perspectives adds so much value to um, to a team, which is why I always say to people when they go to hackathons, don't try and find someone. Because I think a lot of people make the mistake of saying, okay, I'm a JavaScript dev. Right. I need to find three other JavaScript devs. And it's like, no, actually, you want to find people who don't do that. So therefore, they can complement your skills. So I love that. It's perfect, Denise. And maybe we should hear Peter's point of view on what he thought of my content. I know I connected with Denise first. We, we started the conversation, started working together, and Peter joined a bit later on. So I'll be interested to hear um, a bit about Peter when you came on board, and then we'll jump back into, I suppose, the whole timeline of how we all work together. Sure thing, yeah. And, and stop me if I'm making kind of repetitive points from uh, from from Denise no as well, worries. but um, yeah, you know, I think <laughs> you know, I think uh, what what first kind of turned me around is is looking at you know, I saw your open source content first, of course, and that's really important to us at the company and to me personally for for so many years. I've always worked at open source companies, um, so I really liked your your focus on that and your commitment to it, um, and. And then as I started kind of browsing through your video catalog and some of the, the other activities you've done, um, the, the inclusive manner in which you kind of presented open source, you know, it's a place for everyone. It's something everyone can do. And, um, you know, I think I think it's gone a long way to kind of foster the the, the kind and inclusive community that you've created. Uh, I love um, Denise and I have been having a lot of fun in your in your Eddie Hub. So you know, you bring your whole self to it. You know, don't you? It's not just uh, it's not just you know you're cranking out videos. You know, there's a uh, you know you're actively engaged on on LinkedIn, on Twitter, and you know you're you're on Discord. You're not just there. You're participating in conversations. You're helping people make connections. So there's a lot more to you than than a YouTube channel um, and and great content. And uh, the open source alignment, like I said, really important, you know, in an age of open source companies turning to server side public license, <laughs> you know, and and non open source, uh, non open source licenses, you know, we're, we're really committed to to staying that way uh, at Datastax and, and staying behind Apache public license and permissive licenses, you know, um, even in even in this era. So. Uh, that that was just one gigantic thing that I noticed like right off the bat. And I just released a video on licensing a couple of days ago. So that was perfect that you said that. Everyone off this live stream, go go check that out because I, I do touch on the different licenses, not a massive deep dive, but hopefully it's helpful to people um, to understand those. And and you're right, it is important that we when we use projects, we do look at the license that they, they use so we don't get kind of paint ourselves into a corner in the future. And yep. so how do we work together? So I think uh, if I remember correctly, Denise and me, we, we had a call and you talked about some ideas. My memory is so bad, Denise, you're gonna to have to remind me. How did the journey go of us getting to a video together where the three of us worked on and liked it? Yeah, I, I feel like it was, and, and Eddie, you're putting a lot of trust in my memory, um, especially being that I'm a few hours away from a sabbatical, so I'm just starting to let it all, let it all go down, but... Um, Oh gosh! So you've, you've I remember... got a PhD in your title, so I trust you. You must be able to like. You must be so much smarter right. than me. Trust her. She's a doctor. Exactly. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Um, you know, Eddie, I just remember when we first hopped on a call, right? So, uh, just to set the context, maybe for some people who are just now joining the live stream, as as a professional educator. Uh, myself because teaching was my my first career before I realized that I was a little too young at the time to be in charge of a classroom so I went ahead and kept going in academia to finish my PhD I I have this passion for the learner's journey and for the teaching experience so I had already watched some of your videos to uh, you know influence my learner's experience my learner journey because I was new to JavaScript uh, so that context had already been set I had seen you do your thing I knew that our outcome experience that we were going to create with this video was exactly like the journey I was hoping to put that we could do together on YouTube. So that outcome, I already knew we weren't going to have to shape. 
learner's experience was a big check. And to be honest, that's the most important thing, right? Like that's why people are on YouTube. So when we first had that conversation, Eddie, I had all these things like already like that you had passed in my mind, like all these gates that you had come through with flying colors. And I felt like we just needed to see how we vibed, what our energy was like. And if we could just have that idea that would spark curiosity on each end. And uh, we just within a few minutes, we're talking about uh, what data Sachs is doing, the direction we're going in and how we're trying to make an open source data like full stack for developers to use. And you just already started throwing out ideas. And I could just already feel that vibe in the first two minutes that we were gonna have a good time generating ideas and just seeing what we could create together. Because again, that's the part of the experience. Just letting people feel the fire on curiosity and letting them go after what they think is cool. And thank you so much for that recap and that positive note. I want to throw a bit of a kind of a, what's the word, a teaser in for later on to let everyone know we did have some challenges and we'll get to those in a bit because when we went over to Peter, full transparency, I re-recorded the video or well, half of it and I chopped a quarter of it out. So we'll get to that shortly. There wasn't all smooth sailing but it was definitely worth it and and i learned a lot on the process so it was it was good we'll get to that um i just thought cool, i'll cool. throw that out there so i don't know if decent denise you were aware of that or not i i was not okay. um and the reason i was not was mainly just because again to the point about outcomes if you're a content creator and you're you know following this uh this retro trying to understand like what is it about this you know experience that's that's helping elevate eddie and elevate this community it really is paying really close attention to that outcome uh whenever you're about to teach others or share with others others on youtube and you know you already i knew whatever you're going to put out there was going to was going to achieve it so i just kind of stepped back from the actual process in the middle it was um i was definitely happy with what what went out and, and we'll explain more we'll give you a bit more background and context yourself shortly so i think the next step was i i scripted it and i don't think i showed you the script i think i showed you like the high level storyboard just which is kind of like six steps it's going to be um a bit about if anyone wants to see the video i think it was like a month ago on my channel and i can get the link and share it but uh yeah, because I did a high level and then I went and recorded it. And I think I was, um, Denise was changing positions. So I started mm -hmm. working more with Peter. Did I miss anything out or was it how the timeline went? That's exactly how the timeline went. Yep. Yeah, okay, you got it. cool. So I think by the time I started working, I had met Peter before, if I remember correctly, but by the time I started working more with Peter, I, I had recorded the video. I had recorded two parts. One was like the theory um, behind it. And the second part was actually the, the coding and doing part of it. And I think I showed Peter, I think it was the, was it the first part first, I think. And you said it was great, maybe a bit long. I'll let you answer that. Actually. I don't wanna put words in your mouth. And then, yeah. and then I showed you the second part and then I showed it to you together. And I think you were quite happy with it, but you said, I like it, but if I, in the future, if I could change anything, I would do this, this, and this. And it made me think, he's not asking me to change it now, but actually the ideas are quite good and I want the video to be better. And Peter, correct me if I'm wrong. Was it something like that? My memory is so bad. I don't even know what I had for breakfast. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was exactly that's, it, man. You know, you nailed it. Okay. You nailed it. I, we we saw an early version of, of of the video, and I had kind of picked up the ball from Denise midstream, so I, I wasn't sure whether you had scripted stuff beforehand or how much, um, uh, you know, how much you'd kind of gone over, um, you know, the, the 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 Stargate technology or the the Astro technology, you know, or like to, so to what degree, you know, you were familiar with with the offerings and then as we went through you know what what you showed me we were realizing and learning along the way that um you know we wanted to talk about stargate as a technology to kind of democratize access to cassandra a lot of people uh, in the past maybe have struggled with it um 
and as a developer, you know, and they've we're, we're, we've been working a lot to make it easier for developers to access, right? So that, hey, you can just use APIs you already know, right? You create a database schema, uh, API endpoints just flip on that you don't have to write, and there's your data access layer. You know, that's uh, significantly less complicated. Um, uh, for you as a developer to work with. And so we were like, well, do we put the emphasis on Stargate or do we put the emphasis on Astra because Astra just packages it up and it's ready for you to use? You know, and when I was on the Spring team years ago, you know, you could download uh, Spring libraries via HTTP. And, and we made a decision to cap that and cut that off and force people to use Maven and Gradle. Why? Why would you take a, an access method for software out of developers' hands? Because the experience was horrible. <laughs> you know, downloading HTTP binaries yourself and the dependency management in Gradle and Maven was just orders of magnitude better, right? And so, you know, we kind of realized that halfway through that, you know, we might want to, for, for short videos like this and for learners maybe that are starting out their career, let's give them, let's make sure we put the easiest possible method in front of them. And so that's why when we were looking at the content, we're like, oh, wait a minute, hold on. We should focus a little bit less on Stargate because it's an enabling technology. You know, if you want to play with it yourself, right? You can set it up on a Docker container, you can DIY it, download it. But just if you're just wanting to get started, right? And you're wanting to focus on the Discord bot, for example, like, okay, let's not have a fuss about the database. Like, let's just get that working. So, uh, you know, that was that was kind of the course correction that that we were we were realizing kind of part of the way through as well, right? We were learning with you, you know, um, as as we were making this because the technology was fairly uh, fairly new. We only debuted Stargate uh, on Astra back in, uh, what was it, Denise, October, I think, of 2020. So this was all fairly it, it new. Was. You know, to... Yeah. It was very new because yeah. I think when I started planning the video, I didn't even have access to Astra serverless yet. I only had the local version. And I remember talking to it with Denise and he said, oh, it's just a URL change to connect to it, but you can still carry on, you know, creating the video and planning it. So yeah, it was it was very, very new. So it was great to be one of the first people to to use it and create a video on it. So that was awesome. And uh, I know Anya created a video on it, I think a couple of weeks before potentially. And that was mm -hmm. also Indeed. really, really interesting as well. Yeah, she did a great job on that, yeah. Uh, and also I see in the chat, so some questions for the audience before we move further with the whole timeline and journey. Uh, Nick says um, that uh, he uses MongoDB. I know a lot of people use MongoDB. So I'd be really curious to know, um, everyone in the audience, why do you go to Mongo first? Is it because people talk about it more? Is it it's just, a, um, it's just what's used more in the community? Or it, it sounds like less scary? Um, I appreciate some people have probably used it multiple times, so it's what they know. But why was the first time you used it? Like, what what was the reason for for using that? And uh, Jay also mentions uh, that he saw the video by Cushy on uh, Astra DB as well, um, which was uh, awesome. I think, yeah, so it was Cushy's first video. I think she's just passed five hundred yeah. views, which is amazing. Like, really, really good. Nice awesome. job. That is really good. Because she's yeah. not here, but if she was, we would have a bit of a sound effect and uh, say, well done. <laughs> um, so if cause she does watch the replay, you have a sound effect um, for, for doing that. Uh, totally. She nailed it. Right it was really, park, really yeah. well done for first video. Like, um, it was just amazing. I, know, I couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't believe it either. It's great. And... I suppose I know pe people are thinking again. So I mentioned that I re-recorded the, the video and I know a lot of people might think, because we've got a lot of people in the chat who want to get into freelancing, you know, want to know how to find clients and all the rest and might be thinking, well, Eddie, why did you re-record it? You've agreed a price, you kind of agreed it. And I did mention that it was an improvement. But I think also it, to give a shout out to um, the DevRel team at Datastax, uh, Denise, uh, Peter, and loads of others that I've done Twitter spaces with, with and so on, that, you know, that, to be honest, we won't talk about the actual numbers, but I can give percent, percentages in terms of there was no negotiation on the rate. And for me, I don't negotiate my rate. My rate is what it is. But some people try it on and I don't negotiate, not because I want to be difficult, but because I don't have time. Like time for me is my biggest factor. I don't want all this back and forth, back and forth. Uh, I feel like if a fair rate, if people don't like it, 
you know, kind of good luck to them, no problem. So there's no negotiation negotiation on that. So that saved time. So for me, it's time. And working with Denise and Peter, it was always quite smooth and really friendly and really easygoing. And everything was, you know, a suggestion, I think, which I thought was quite impressive. So when, when Peter came up with a suggestion that would make me need to re-record it because I couldn't tweak it, um, I learned that I should always send someone the script first, even if they don't ask for it, because then they can just get some eyes on it and it's easier to make changes then rather than record it, edit it, and then having to make changes and re-record it. But because it had we'd worked together so well, I think we were all on the same page. It was all very... Yeah, very friendly. I felt like we were, at a, we were friends at a hackathon, really. It didn't feel like work that I thought, you know what, I want to make this better. And obviously I want, you know, Peter to, to be, and Denise to be super happy with it. Um, and I, I saw this as improvements. It wasn't like, well, that's the same. You're just asking me to I don't know, do something slightly different. Like if you're getting in the back of a car. Can I get this icon in periwinkle blue, please? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It wasn't like I want more border radius of an extra few pixels or something like like there was value to totally. it i could see it so i was more than happy to re-record it and uh yeah i was really happy with outcomes a big shout out to to both of you and i think that's important for everyone to realize that when you're working with your clients you kind of get that feeling at the beginning and so i think that feeling's usually right and i think if the client's trying to make an effort and trying to be accommodating and so are you, then you'll both do that give and take. I mean, to give an example, I had, uh, I won't mention any names, a client recently, and I said, learning from this situation, I sent them a script. They didn't want the script, but I sent them the script. Um, and they said, okay, we'll review it. Anyway, they, they changed a lot of little things like the, this and that. And I thought, that's fine. Um, I haven't recorded it so I can make those changes. And they went, yeah, can you remove the bit about you, remove the bit that adds value and just have a shout out about our thing? And I just thought, but I don't do like promotional uh, videos. Yeah. Like it's an informational video, happy to include your stuff. Um, and uh, I said, that's not what I do. It's not what we agreed. And it's like, take it or leave it. Uh, so they, they went, okay, that makes sense. A video does need to add value. I'm like, it does. So yeah, working with you know other people is just very very different. Anyway, enough saying good things about both of you. Maybe we get back into well, I, the. I kind of also want to dig in there. Okay, <laughs> sure, go ahead. And the, the, I mean, well, I mean, first, uh, I do now feel like every time we tweet, we need to use periwinkle blue emojis. <laughs> like just, just <laughs> that needs to happen. Um, no, uh, but Eddie, as 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 much as we were kind of making it feel like it was. Uh, a bad experience. I, I just want to, from my perspective, the difference is in what's important. And we are truly here trying to share knowledge. There's a lot of very difficult aspects that come into play when you are working with cloud databases and cloud-based APIs and making examples in context of something cool like a Discord bot. That's way more meaningful just for sharing knowledge and, and just kind of lifting up everyone in the community than some of the other items you were mentioning. And I feel like that's where we all just quickly aligned. And it, it really goes back to all the research that we did before I even cold emailed you, which honestly is just because you made your email accessible on your YouTube page. I was able to just go to your about page, get your email, and I sent you a cold email. But it was all of all of that work that we had done before of just clearly seeing that you liked to communicate learning outcomes and to teach and to make a community. And that was already such a part of your journey that and we were already aligned on that core that we kind of were hoping that it was going to be an, an easy collaboration. Does that make sense? That does make sense. And yeah, no, it does. It does. And I, and I, and I really appreciate that. And I think, you know, Eddie Hub is, a, is an awesome community. And I think I, I love being involved in it hands on, as Peter mentioned earlier as well, because the community are so kind of inclusive and awesome. I mean, even today, like to give an example, a big shout out to a lot of people who are in the chat, uh, Kewalia um, and a few others. Sorry if I don't mention any names. Shout yourself out in the chat. 
but today they said they wanted to practice public speaking um and i said yeah we can open an audio channel on discord and you can all practice i had meetings i couldn't join as long as a mod can join and actually karuna who's in the chat who's one of our mods um i think nick hadn't woken up by that time because nick's in the washington time zone uh, but Karuna in, in IST was up and said, yep, I can moderate the um, the call to practice their public speaking. And it was great. You know, they created a Discord, uh, sorry, Discord a GitHub discussion so that people could um, put their topics they wanted to talk about. And they all got a bit of time to practice their public speaking. And then in each thread in the discussion, they gave their feedbacks and suggestions to each other. And I only joined right at the end because of my meetings. But just seeing them collaborate on that was just super awesome. You know, it wasn't something that I initiated. And, but I'm really passionate about everyone practicing their public speaking. So just seeing them organize that together. And now they want to do it weekly, which I think is just amazing because they're oh, going to so have great. a schedule. And they're going to work together and, and do it. And, you know, another shout out for the community. I mentioned right at the beginning, I think I did, Carl, who's in the chat, who's working with uh, Astra and also has written um, a Nest.js um, plugin for it. But even Peter messaged me, I think, a couple of days ago, or maybe even yesterday, and said, Someone on our DevRel team is building an NPM package that will create the namespace. I was like, oh, Carl wrote a script separate to the um, Nest uh, JS. Yeah. And I love it how, you know, you're just connecting directly with my community members. And you said, hey, can you just connect us? So therefore you can connect your DevRel person with Carl. And I, I just love that. It just seems exactly. really authentic. There isn't these kind of layers where they can only speak to X person. And then it's kind of like... I don't know, you've got this whole yeah. ranking. It's just like, just connect people, let them collaborate, let them work together. And I think that was awesome. Yeah, I'm hoping they can learn from each other a little bit. Um, uh, Kirsten was working on this this NPM setup thing. So I'm hoping I'm hoping they can contribute or, or, or you know inspire each other or learn from each other in some way. Um, and yeah, just to go back real quick about what you said about the outline, you know, I think one of the reasons why it's super valuable and, and I'm really glad you picked up on it is because, you know, sometimes like folks like Denise and I, we'll have other people that we have to answer to that need to review these videos and they may have a very different perspective right from from us and they may come and say something like oh yeah did you forget you know the the thing or what about this you know and if that point if you've inked the video it's it's too late right and so um as someone that's produced so many of these videos myself and like ended up with file names like final final v4 final underscore <laughs> la absolutely last one final dot mp4 you know you you end up with it's just it just saves so much of that right to, to have that script and and uh, uh and to be able to get alignment you know on on or as you pointed out you know sometimes disalignment <laughs> right like no i'm not gonna do that <laughs> like no way um so uh you know a super super great practice and um, um just please just punch us so you pick up on it i think that's awesome you know you you uh you, i see i watch you learn new stuff and uh and both of us right in front of each other uh, all the time so it's awesome and I think that's and, important. Oh, sorry, Denise, carry on. Yeah, I mean, what Eddie or, or what Peter just said. Do you guys realize how important that is? That we are all willing just to let down whatever experience we had before these collaboration moments, and learn together. There's absolutely something different about about Eddie's perspective and Peter's perspective, and mine as well. That are going to make it more, um, it's just going to make the end product or the, the end video that much better by all learning together openly, instead of being concerned about how much you know, and how much I know, you run into that so quickly in tech. And uh, that just God, doesn't yeah. happen. Uh, <laughs> it, it's just not how people with data stacks work. And it's just not how uh, you, you know, collaborating with you has been Eddie. And I, I absolutely love it. It's like, such a joy to get to be a part of working with you and, and to do stuff like what we're doing right now. Yeah. That's uh, so awesome. And, and I love that. And I think people need to realize that it's about collaboration. And I think that's really important. And people won't always agree, but that's good. Because if they disagree, then you, we're hopefully both going to you know, learn something from it. And I think it's just how people collaborate, which is, I think, really important. There's no point kind of people getting kind of, as we say, throwing their toys out the pram or anything like that, because it doesn't 
doesn't succeed, right? It doesn't help anybody. You, if you're all pushing to the same goal, it's just you might have a different point of view of how to get there. And I think that's just what makes it interesting and fun. And especially with tech, like so many things changing all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, okay, I'm totally interjecting again, Eddie. Sure, I'm so no problem. Sorry for continuing to interrupt your no, program. Please do. <laughs> uh, but the uh, some of the Astra engineering team uh, popped into the, uh, the the live YouTube and they were oh, reading awesome. uh, reading some of the chats. And they want to give a shout out to um, and I, I apologize if I say this name wrong. Call C A H L. That's correct. Is that correct? Yeah. They wanted to give a shout out to Call and a massive thank you uh, for contributing over to. Uh, contributing over to our open source, uh, open source uh, Node.js client for Astro this week. Awesome. Uh, that is contributing together with open source. So thank you so much. Uh, Astro Engineering is giving you a thumbs up right now. That's epic. I love that. And I think also, I think it comes to a good note. So thank you very much for joining uh, your your dev team. I think that's awesome that they're here. Do say hi in the, in the chat as well. I think that's really good because people who eventually might want to go freelancing or do want to go freelancing now by doing these sorts of things they're on people's radar and i think you know oh, it's yeah. great right so imagine in a year's time um you know carl wants to reach out to you you're going to remember them as the person who contributed to your project rather than just it's not a cold call anymore right and even the team right you might have moved yeah. to a different team but other people in the team will remember oh they contribute to our project and i think that's why i, I always love and always encourage our community to contribute to um, everyone's open source projects and i do say contribute and add value i don't say raise a pull request i know carl raised a pull request but i think adding value and contributions is not just a pull request it could be um, improving documentation, it could be logging a bug, or if there's a bug already, re-confirming uh, that the bug is there on maybe a different platform or version, etc. So I think it's uh, always really awesome for uh, people to to do that. And one thing I always also recommend on top, which I think one of you mentioned earlier on, which is have the same username and profile picture on Discord, GitHub, Twitter. So say for example, like. Carl is a nickname is what I remember correctly. So, but I think it's consistent with GitHub, YouTube, um, Twitter and so on, Discord. So imagine if Carl reached out to Peter on Twitter, but had a different profile picture, a different name, Peter's gonna think, who is this person? I don't know who they are. It's kind of like a cold, cold call and it's quite hard to, to warm up. Whereas if it's with the same picture, same name, yes, it might be on a different platform, but Peter's going to think, oh, yeah, I recognize that name. Oh, yes, they contribute to our open source project or, or whatever it was, wrote a blog post, et cetera. Exactly. And I think it just makes it so much easier to collaborate with people. So I think, yeah, everyone definitely do that. I love that everyone in the community is giving a shout out to Carl as well. So that's awesome. No faster way to get noticed uh, by, you know, by a technology team than to make a contribution, right? They're darn sure they're going to remember like, hey, this person helped out. Awesome. And like you said, it ain't just code, right? It could be doc fixes. It could be, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of things that you can contribute, you know, that, that aren't code. I mean, Cushy's video, amazing, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, you know, I mean, yeah. So, and, uh, and before you mentioned on public speaking, I think uh, there, there's so many new ways to get involved in public speaking. I mean, you, you showed us the magic of Twitter spaces, you know, there's meetups, there, there's so many great ways for, for people to get involved in, in, uh, you know, in, in friendly, you know, kind of non-threatening, you know, intimate environments where they're going to get some feedback before they, you know, jump up on stage, 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 <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, so, um, uh, you know, and, and, and if there are folks in, in, Eddie, in Eddie's community, you know, that are looking for, for ways to do that, um, you know, we, we may be able to help, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I run the San Francisco Java user group, but uh, that probably doesn't help a lot of the JavaScript folks <laughs> too much. But, you know, it turns out that there are people in Java that make JavaScript user interfaces these days, uh, quite a lot of them. So, um, yeah, if you're if you're looking for a place or a venue to present, try your hand at practice uh, at public speaking. Uh, please feel free to hit me up for San Francisco Java user. Maybe talk a little bit about the Java JavaScript connection. There's probably tons of other meetup organizers out there that would love to have you. Absolutely. You're right. Do reach out to meetup organizers. And, you know, you can start practicing with, usually on my live streams, I do Radio Eddie where people can come on audio. I think Denise joined me 
uh, a few weeks ago on that just came on for like five ten minutes and chatted it's a great way for people to practice then yeah go to meetup groups speak at conferences and they just build up to it you don't need to kind of go straight out and i think with lots of calls that we do it might be for someone's job or demoing a project to your boss or your team i think we need to get better at communication and, and public speaking and i think when people say public speaking is a bit like big data. Everyone's perspective is very different. I've had clients in the past who go, we've got big data, we need, I don't know, uh, what's that Google thing? I can't remember, that was a real buzzword years and years ago, like 10 years ago, um, Hadoop. We'd use Hadoop, Hadoop. yeah. And then they've Hadoop. got yeah. like a one gig database that I could probably run on my phone. Like it was nothing big, but for them it was like, it's massive. <laughs> And then you got other people go, yeah, we've only got a couple of terabytes of a database. It's not that big. And it's just like completely the other end. So with public speaking, it could be, you know, a call with one or two people. That could be a public speaking. It could be a private event with five to 10 people. It could be a meetup with 20 to 30. It could be a conference with, you know, one to 100 to 1,000. So, but end of the day, I think it's all kind of very similar. I think the only thing holding us back is probably our, our mind with that as well. And I am conscious of time. I think we've only got Denise for another 15 minutes. So yes, correct, correct. Let's continue with the story and, and the retro part. One thing I do want to say as well, that I just remembered uh, when uh, Peter, I think it was Peter sent me over the contract um, there was a mistake in it. And I, and I think by me being honest with the mistake, actually, I think helped the relationship. So I want to, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I want to tell people that being honest is just an open is so important. Mm -hmm. So one, if you're like running behind time, do say that wasn't the issue that we had. The issue we had is Peter wanted to pay me 50% more than what I said it was going to cost. And, you know, I thought, well, that's very generous, but maybe Peter didn't notice. So I did go back and say, I think you're paying me 50% more than you should. I'm happy to accept it if you really insist, but I think it was a mistake. And Peter amended it and so on. And I think, again, you know, I think some people might try and get away with things. And I just don't think it's worth it for the long term relationship. I see Peter nodding. Peter, I'm going to let you take that one. I wasn't a part of uh, that. One, <laughs> oh, sure, I sure. I, I, I wasn't sure if that was an encouragement to comment or not, but yeah, no, totally. That was, uh, that, that was, that just spoke to your integrity. I mean, you know, uh, yeah. Okay, I, perfect. I, I don't know how much, no, I don't know how much fine. more I could say about it. I mean, no, that's fine. You know, most people would just let that go and, and, you know, corporations would look at that and be like, oh, it's a rounding error. They wouldn't even notice, but you called it out, you know? So it's like, Boy, you know, this is, you know, this is like if he's bringing this level of attention to detail to, to contract and, um, you know, being that kind of forthcoming, like this is a person I can trust and want to continue to work with, you know, and and I can trust with our message. I can trust with content. I can trust with people I refer him to with inside the company, uh, you know, uh, other people I could refer him to. Like it just speaks to your integrity, man. And and uh, it, it's yeah, I mean, it, it's that's the kind of. Those are good people that you want to do more for and do the kinds of things beyond your job description to help. I appreciate that. And the reason why I was kind of bringing that up was I've had a similar mistake when I was hiring freelancers to help me on some of the things that I was doing. And I remember they sent in an invoice for like, I don't know what it was, like $500. And I paid it in pounds, which was about $700. And I didn't realize. And they wrote back and said, you do realize you've only paid me by about $200. And I was like, Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. that. Was just a mistake on on my behalf, and so again, I I, I like to work with people that you know are honest and open, and, and and vice versa. So yeah, everyone definitely be open and honest. I think that's really important. Okay, so I'm getting carried away. So next on the timeline, I think that pretty much covers it. We posted the video. Um, and that, that was really it. What, I suppose, looking back over the whole process, Denise already mentioned a bit, a bit at the beginning about um, kind of pros and cons, but what sort of constructive feedback would you give at a, I suppose, at a high level for people watching? So for our next video, for example, what, if you had a magic wand, what could you, could you change, I suppose? Like anything, I'm thick skinned, I can take it. I'm sure everyone in the chat's gonna be taking notes. Yeah, I, um, 
Okay, so this is this is very much like the teacher in me. I I would really like to see how the audience reacts to this, though. Okay. But awesome. I would love to see. Um, uh, I think like in the in the front a different short, very specific call to action about like just three main like learning experiences that they're going to get during the whole video. Um, just as like a moment to be like, right before we get ready to get started, like boom, boom, boom. These are the three main tech highlights about uh, what we're getting ready to learn. Uh, so look for them throughout the video, kind of helping frame uh, frame expectations a little bit, a little bit with more specificity. Does that make sense? No, that does. I think being, you know, really crystal clear up front. I don't think I did time codes on that video. Maybe I could have done that to match, like you said, yeah. what was being brought up front could really help so people click through. I think that works really well. No, I love that. Brilliant. Okay. I'm, I'm going to write that down and I'm sure someone in my community. We hit on that same point. We hit on that same point, Eddie, remember? Because we, when we were reviewing the video, one of the changes that I had suggested and I was like, we could do this next time, but then you liked it and you were like, I want to re-record it, was let's show them the the bot experience and show them what they're building and what they're gonna get for the effort that they're gonna go through the video, right? And spend some time on that upfront and like demo the end product effectively, right? Uh, rather than just jump into the tutorial and you were totally like, oh yeah, right. You know, let's let's do that, you know, and spend a little bit more time up front, like, you know, kind of showing them this is what they're gonna get. Right, uh, you know, for for your for your efforts, you know, if you spend this time with us uh, on the video, like this is what you'll learn. You know, this is what you can do with what you what you've built, uh, and that I think I think improved the video significantly, and and it, apparently so did you because we're willing to re-record it. <laughs> yeah, I really liked it. I thought I could maybe clip a bit at the end and bring it to the front, but it just wasn't going to be as natural. wasn't going to be there. And I thought, you know what, and I could have re-record sorry recorded an extra bit to go at the beginning but we made some other tweaks as well and i was like you know what let's make it really really natural and let's do it so yes that was really good to show the result at the end so see if people want to invest their time and they can go all the way to the end i love this we have got a question for denise what is the main yeah. point of a freelancer that you value to eventually hire him Great That's question. a that is a great question. Great, great question. And when you are looking across uh, across you know across YouTube for these types of projects, especially when you're new, I can imagine the weight of number of followers or number of views on this one video to show that you're capable of getting reach and all that stuff. And I just want to say that is not what I was looking for, and it wasn't a part of my criteria. They're nice to haves, but to the point of this question, it's the learning experience that is created during the video. Full stop. That is what I'm looking for. Uh, that is what we really value here at Datastack. So to be specific, it's the, it's the overlay and the pace of when you are showing or writing code on screen and then explaining that about how it is, you know, creating certain functionality uh, in your demo, in your app, in your project. It's that overlay and the pacing and the cadence of that and the ease of reading the code that makes all the difference. And uh, I was even, I think I was just writing some tests like just this morning for another project. And I could have, and, and honestly, this project has to be completely open and transparent and easy to communicate to other people. And I could have done this like whiz bang, super deep way to write a uh, unit test for this function I had written that would be, you know, using set theory and math. And I was like, well, or I could just do it really simply so that it was easy to read and easy to follow so that someone else uh, could easily pick up the code and know the idea. And that just is kind of a part of how, Eddie, you write your code. You just, you write it in a way that serves the learning experience first. And that is just so critical, uh, in my opinion, you know, especially as someone who's trying to learn JavaScript, because I am a new person when it comes to JavaScript. Because we know uh, Peter's Java, you're Python, is that correct? Yes, yep, Python. 
we do have a lot of <laughs> Python people in the chat as well. I know, I know Nick is uh, TypeScript, but we have Karuna, I know is Python. I think Jay might be Python as well. Everyone write in the chat, what's your kind of main go-to language? I know a lot of you use multiple ones, because I have seen those Python people that I mentioned also use JavaScript and TypeScript. Um, so yeah, do yeah, that in the chat. Yeah, the, the main JavaScript I have used um, up until getting to work on uh, work on projects with you and other full stack projects, the, the main JavaScript I had used was the D3 visualization library uh, with Observable and Mike Bostock, mainly because they have these really beautiful, easy to understand ways to visualize graph data. And uh, for those of you following along, you know I'm a big graph nerd. It's like my thing. I can't get away from it. I love it too much. Uh, so that was my only JavaScript experience really before we got to work together. So on that note, if uh, if Peter doesn't mind, I would love to hear a little bit more about graphs. So we've mentioned it a few times. Are you able to kind of say a few sentences about about what it what it is to give people a bit more of an idea? Because I'm really new to graph. I've kind of got an idea about it. And uh, while uh, while you're saying that, I'm sure people will write some questions in the chat as well. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. So um, thanks for that, Eddie. And uh, you know, absolutely can go as deep as you all would like on this topic. Uh, but for for graphs, uh, when we are talking about graphs, we're talking about relationships. And we're talking most specifically about relationships between uh, data points that you're working with. And I, Eddie, I will never forget the first time I ever learned about a graph. I'm going to tell that story if that's OK. Yeah, please do. I, uh, so I uh, was in graduate school and uh, it was my first uh, my first semester as a uh, grad student in mathematics getting my master's and I we were doing online registration and I got locked out of all the classes that I needed to take for my degree so the only thing available class called graph theory and I'm gonna be honest I thought it was like the theory of bar charts and pie graphs and I was dragging my feet into class that first semester the very first day thinking I was spending like a whole semester doing business data visualization uh, because I'm going to be honest I'm not the kid who reads the book before class <laughs> I might have a PhD but I don't read books before class anyways um, so we were uh, we walked into class and Dr. Teresa Haynes who I've now come to know is one of the most published academics in graph theory she just goes up to the whiteboard and she draws a circle and she connects it to another circle and then connects it to one more circle. And she just says, this is you, this is your friend, and this is the friend of your friend. Studying the edges and the links between data is what graph theory is about. And I'll just never forget my mind opening and, and realizing, oh my gosh, there's this whole dimension to data that you miss when you work with it in spreadsheets or in tables uh, or in all of these other shapes that I had found so far in my in my uh, tech career, tech life. Uh, and so ever since that moment, uh, it has just been a, a passion of mine to understand how these structures evolve over time and then to write programs that can work with them. And some of my favorite things that I'm even working on now, as I actually just force pushed to master in another project, uh, is doing a, is doing graph visualization. Uh, you know, and I love the Observable D3 library for that. So, it's just it's something I love, and uh, it's it's just really fun to see data and to really think about the relationships between it. And if someone wants to learn more, do you have any recommendations on like a good resource where they can go learn the basics about graph and get started? Oh gosh, um, so many good resources on this topic. I did write a book. book um, <laughs> are you being modest so you don't want to shout that out? Actually, that's true. I think I had that in your title. Let me see. Um, yes, O'Reilly Media Guide to Graph Data. I've slightly abbreviated that title because it wasn't space. Um, so yes, that's a good resource to, to have. She's not going to promote herself, so I'll do it for her. <laughs> Love that. Love that. <laughs> Definitely. I think that's... Uh... Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Love the I, You know, I, and there's... The, the graph community is such an incredible community. Like, uh, and so I was trying to think of other people to lift up as well. Um, uh, a gentleman named Daniel Cuppets is someone I've learned from a lot. And he has a website called sql2gremlin.com and it helps you translate 
SQL database queries into um, graph language queries, which is called Gremlin. Uh, so I really love that resource. Uh, I know there is, oh gosh, there's a YouTuber, and I'm not thinking of their name, but there's a YouTuber that does some really great intros to graph videos. Uh, Amy Hodler from Neo4j is another author, uh, uh, O'Reilly Media author on how to use the Neo4j graph database uh, to do data science. And I don't know, there's just so many really cool people in this community that while I absolutely love uh, for you all to go pick up my book, uh, it's something that it was a passion project of mine that came out during the pandemic and I sadly didn't get to kind of do my conference tour and talk about it like I hoped. Um, well, yes, I thank you for the promo. I really appreciate it, but <laughs> there's plenty of people in the community as well. Awesome. We have another question. Do you have time for another question? Because if not, I think this is a generic question that Peter could also take. Uh, yeah, happy to take one more. Okay, well, if you need to jump off, do jump off when you, when you need to. It's cool. We're all very relaxed here. So the question is again from, it's an I, not a J. So I said Jason, so my apologies. So it's, I guess it's Ison. Is that how you pronounce it? Let me know in the chat. I'm not sure. And hopefully I get it right. What are the best ways to get noticed by recruiters? In my defense, I'm probably the worst person to answer this because I'm the opposite. I do everything I can not to get noticed by recruiters because I already get like 500 of those a day and 99% of them are irrelevant and they think Java is the same as JavaScript, which is just drives me up the, up the wall. Or well, they just don't read it. It's like, yes, I used to do Java, but it's not something I do so much anymore. And uh, yeah, they say, but it's, it's the same. You, it's obviously the same. It's like, I can see Peter going on oh, no. though. If they just did like a little bit of research, I, I think if a recruiter, so I'm taking a side note here, but if a recruiter did a little bit of effort like to read the profile or whatever it was, I think they'd clean up. But anyway, enough from me. Um, back to Denise and, yeah. and uh, Peter on uh, yeah, how to get noticed by recruiters. Yeah, um, Peter, I'd be really curious to see like what's your number one thing that you look for. And in the context of this, I'm assuming by recruiters, we mean recruiters for engineering jobs uh, instead of recruiters for sourcing freelance clients, because um, there's there's two different things. And we've talked about the latter a lot today so far. So for the for the former, like recruiters, because you want to work at tech company X. The number one thing that we look for, or that I know that I look for when I'm doing my own sourcing is open source uh, and GitHub contributions. I'm gonna go directly to your GitHub profile. If you don't have any projects, considering I probably have 30 to 40 applicants, that's already gonna probably not set you up well. So absolutely keep that GitHub profile up to date, uh, feature your favorite projects. I don't need a green timeline. Like I'm not looking for a timeline that's fully green. Uh, but I am looking to see that you do contribute and that you uh, put an eye uh, of detail towards communication to make sure that your project can be used by someone else and not that you're just throwing stuff up there. But absolutely, GitHub's the first place I go. I, I don't know. Peter, what about you? What do you look for? Agreed. I mean, I, I'm usually not in the path of doing engineering hiring, to be honest. So uh, I have kind of a different set of things that I look for because I'm, I'm usually I'm usually not in that path. Um, or if I'm if I'm interviewing someone for uh, like a dev role, role or an engineering uh, a role that has an engineering component, uh, usually there's it's communication skills and I can I can figure that out from their Twitter, their timelines, their LinkedIn posts, um, you know, videos that they've done, uh, any of the any of those sorts of things. You know, you can look for those uh, communication skills and um, you know other other soft skills are, are kind of evident, right? As you uh, uh, as you read their communications. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, I, but also like if I was in the engineering, you know, path, you're absolutely right. You know, GitHub profiles is, is a great way to go. Let code speak for you. Um, and, and, you know, a record of contributing to other open source projects, uh, certainly because, uh, you, you know, that's a lot of what open source is about for any company that you're going to work to that has an open source motion. They want to see that you're out there getting involved in other engineers projects, um, and, and, and widening the, the community. I love that how you both um, covered like the two important things, right? It, GitHub is important, but it's not 
just about the green squares although we do promote green squares that's how people get excited like gamify it but end of the day it does also matter how you kind of communicate how you collaborate and that's why it's important to have those tweets out there have those blog posts if you can have videos as well again that just really helps their strength and their position you're absolutely right because you could have like 30 40 people and they're going to stand out more with those okay so oh and i should say I should totally say uh, something critical oversight. Um, you know, obviously the companies you've worked for and the experience you've had in the, in the past makes a, a huge difference. Um, and I think for, for, you know, industry versus like tech, you know, or, or Silicon Valley vendors, you know, I think that that has carries a slightly different weight, you know, where um, experience speaks, but then also, you know, your code speaks, but also the experiences in the previous companies you've worked for, uh, I think leave an impression uh, that varies by whether you're, you know, applying for uh, a vendor at a vendor or whether you're applying for like an industry position or something like that. Sorry, I just want to get that in there because that's super important. No, that's great. Absolutely I love that. couldn't agree more. Love so that. I'm going to go ahead and silently drop, but it was sure. really, really great. Uh, so good to see you, Eddie. Thank you so much for joining us on this live stream. Great to geek out with you again and uh, enjoy your, what have you got coming up in like three hours, four hours? In, uh, in like four hours and 15 minutes. Uh, I'm starting a, a summer sabbatical. Uh, I will awesome. be back in August. I uh, cannot wait to join Peter and the Data Stacks crew, uh, but I'm going to be hiking around the United States all summer and uh, I'm really looking forward to the time. Awesome. Well, have a safe trip, have lots of fun and look forward to geeking out with you when you get back. Will do. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Denise. Peter, should we answer a few more questions and then maybe we, it's Friday, we will uh, we will call it a day. Or yeah. Minute, Awesome. So which channel in Discord are, are we uh, so are you sourcing stuff from, by the way? Oh, just in the YouTube chat. Oh, YouTube chat. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah. And let me remove uh, Denise off the screen. So otherwise she's frozen. <laughs> there we go. Okay, awesome. Got right. It. So some of the questions I saw in the chat were always really good. Uh, okay, Kunal put a queue in front. That's awesome. That really, really helps. So if other people can do the same, that will be super helpful. So the question, and if you have put the question in already, just copy and paste it back in. The question from Kunal was, I've heard many people say that reviews matter a lot when freelancing and getting clients, but what about a beginner with not many project reviews, how to stand out? So did you... I don't think I had my website up, which has reviews and testimonials on there when um, when we got connected. So maybe it doesn't help as much as I think it does. On that note, though, I should get a review from you so I could put something on my site, like a testimonial. Or <laughs> so thank you, Kunal, nice. for the reminder. Right. <laughs> totally. You got to ask for those LinkedIn endorsements or they never end up there, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, Kunal, I think, um, sure. I mean, honestly, like we noticed Cushy's video, um, not just because she knew Eddie, but because she clearly took the time to look at our example code, um, you know, produce a great video and th the subject matter was on point. Like, you know, it, that, that got attention much more than, you know, great reviews about, you know, reading your profile next to a bunch of others would, it's like that, that, that pushes a signal towards the person you're trying to get the attention of, right? In the form and format that you're, that you're potentially looking to be hired in. So it's just like, you're kind of letting your work speak for you rather than having a profile that's sort of sitting in a directory being like, you know, yay, I worked with uh, Kunal and, you know, the experience is great. Sure. That kind of stuff is always important, no doubt, you know, but, um, uh, and maybe more important for, for a beginner because you don't have the catalog, you know, like Denise was saying, she went and looked at Eddie's content catalog and it, it just, the work spoke for itself, right? It just, it passed a lot of check marks, you know, just right then and there. Um, and so in Cushy's example, like if she wanted to freelance with us, you know, for example, like I could just go look at that video she did. She's already shown data stack subject matter expertise. She's shown how easy it is to work with, um, uh, with with Cassandra and Astra and and all, also a command that just like no SQL is more than just document database right it's not just uh, throwing JSON at a document store uh, that there's 
uh, different types of NoSQLs. And, and you know what I mean? It just she immediately showed she had that command. And when putting a, a very clear signal about our tech as well, it's like, oh, wow, she's done the homework. She's looked at our example code and, and, is, and made a video out of it. Awesome. What a clear signal. What a way to distinguish yourself from the pack by having a targeted, you know, I want this person to hire me. I'm going to show them that I know their stuff already. Like, brilliant, you know. Love that. And uh, just go through a few more questions. So the next one is, let me bring that up. What are your thoughts on cold emailing or networking with recruiters rather than applying to all the jobs? Huh. Interesting. Um, <laughs> hmm. Cold emailing or networking with recruiters rather than applying. Yeah. I mean, um, I, 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 hmm. Both? I certainly tried to work with recruiters early on. I mean, Eddie, I, you know, I, I don't know about you. Uh, it sounds like you've tried to actively avoid recruiters. <laughs> For 10 years, like seriously, right. just yeah. avoid them. Because they find they waste time. I kind of have too. Yeah. I, I mean, you, I've never worked with recruiters either, but I'm lucky. Like I, I live in the Valley, so I got to know people in the Valley. So I just worked with my network. You know, if you're, if you don't have a network to be on the inside of, you know, then you know what I mean? Then that, then that opportunity may be denied you. And it's like, how do you find a way into it? Um, but uh, I haven't, I've been had the luxury, I should say, of not having to work with recruiters because uh, I maintain, I created that network purposefully and I maintain it uh, and I keep in touch with people um, and, and call them for, you know, no reason. Right. You know, and, and there's a tax there. It's, it's work, you know, but uh, I, I enjoy the people I, I connect with and, you know, want to want to talk to them on a regular basis so you know it's not just all you know networking or what have you so uh the networking is is was the, always been the biggest thing for me and where the the best jobs always come from if you don't have that luxury um yeah you know recruiters recruiters can definitely be of a value for sure um you know a, a cold outreach is is tough you know um that's a tough thing. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I have any sage words of wisdom there. That's that's a tricky one. It is. Well, it was applying for all jobs. If there's a job being posted, then you know probably apply to it. But also maybe network with recruiters because they might know about jobs that aren't posted yet. But there is a, I think, a risk with working with recruiters, as in they kind of tell you what you want to hear, but they're telling. 50 other people, other candidates, what they want to hear as well, because they don't want you to take a job somewhere else. So uh, they are playing a numbers game and they're just trying to put all these, like they, 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 they sound like you, I don't want to say too many bad things about recruiters, but they want to say that you're best friend, but they're really not, like you're just a number to them. And, and so that's why I don't like, um, don't like working with them so much because I find they just you know waste a lot of time but don't get me wrong at the beginning of the first five years of my career before I got into open source then I was working with recruiters and that was as Peter said kind of a tax that I, I had to pay um, for that so I would try both if you can go direct with the company it's, it's, it's probably better but then going with a recruiter might also work try both try in spread the risk a little bit let's say and, and see and see what works yeah i like this one as well because how important is documentation delivering in a freelance environment design validation verification templates maybe requirement specification i think it's really important i don't know what your thoughts are peter Sorry, I was just looking for the mute button. 100% agree. Uh, I mean, we were talking about that in terms of the script, yeah, right? Exactly. You know, of, of the content itself. I think the ancillary documents around it are are important. You know, having uh, a standard contract or or being able to accept a vendor's contract, like being prepared for the paperwork aspects of these things too, can take a lot of friction. You know, to your point, Eddie, right? What was you said the highest order bit, right? Was what time? Like, I don't want to do the nine million back and forth dance. On, on stuff that isn't what I care about, i.e. the content, right? So, you know, if, if we can put that stuff to bed quickly by being organized uh, on both sides, right? Absolutely. Then, yay, yeah. that, that, that's a good thing. So beyond just design docs, validation, verification templates, requirement specifications, scripts, you know, storyboards, that kinds of stuff, um, uh, especially in your initial touches, 
with 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 you know in your first projects with folks where you're getting to know each other uh that kind of stuff is important once you've been working together for six months like okay you know you might not need as much of that right because uh they've learned you know you've learned their style they've learned your requirements you know and you may need to document you know everything to the nth degree a, bit, a little bit less um depends on the organization true and i think you know it shows that level of professionalism like you said um it's kind of i find it weird when i say to people can you send me an invoice for the work you did they say what's an invoice and i think well, if you're freelancing you should know what uh what an invoice is and and so on and uh just just things like that so the first time you do it it's probably harder but then after that you've probably got documentation templates storyboard templates um loads of stuff that you can reuse but yeah having that the first time is quite hard but documentation is so important it makes you stand out and imagine um the client is probably working with other people on other projects or different parts of the projects why should they give you that next phase of that project over somebody else you both might be doing a good good job you both might have good communication but if you want to stand out go that extra mile so therefore they think you know what we want to use this person i know they're going to do a better better job and at the beginning like peter said at the beginning you probably have to make more of an effort than later on as you get to know each other a lot can a lot more assumptions can be can be made so they like that also yeah, just, that you know, if you end up getting hung up if you end up getting hung up in in you know contracts or you know a bunch of paperwork or things like that you know it's just you, you're both here to produce some sort of a result whatever it is you know usually it's a piece of content um you know and if you spend a month in paperwork before you even lay down a, a single second of video it's like ugh, okay you know <laughs> you know on both sides right not not just me like yeah. you know a, a, you know on both sides right so yeah no problem Kunal. um and whoever said documentation is always important i think it was nicole uh, or, uh, I, the name yeah. went by a little quick yeah, yeah nicholas sorry uh right on yeah 100 percent agree yep documentation is king absolutely yeah uh okay i think oh a nice uh positive comment here from uh I should, I should need to look up book through the chat to find out the phonetical way to pronounce it. Sorry. Um, I can't remember. I didn't practice it enough. Um, Peter's voice is so satisfying. What are you trying to say? That mine isn't. That's a bit harsh. Come on. <laughs> uh, okay. The burn. No. Yeah. Ouch. It's, it's a fail on my side. Oh, hardly. Hardly. <laughs> Uh, okay, we'll take a couple more and then I'm, I know uh, Peter's quite busy, so I don't take too much of Peter's time. So the next question we have is from Diana. Um, how to know who to who exactly you should connect? I've got a thought on this, but I might let Peter go first. And as Peter's thinking, then I can go first. No, I, I, I'm just not. I need a little more context. Like, I'm not sure what he or she is asking. Diana, um, could you next. give a, a bit more information? I, I have a thought on this. Uh, yeah, you know, go who, for it. Who exactly um, you should connect to, I suppose, if you're on LinkedIn or on socials, like who you should reach out to. I would definitely recommend when you reach out that I get like, I don't know, 500 LinkedIn connections a day, but I ignore most of them because they have no context. I don't know these people, haven't collaborated with them on GitHub or anything like that. If I recognize the name or the photo and I've collaborated with them on Discord or, or GitHub, I'll accept. Whereas for people, when it's a cold connection, you need to give context, like why we should, should we could connect and write a message saying, I know, I really enjoyed your content on this. Um, I'd love to collaborate. I'd love to be in a network because of X, Y, and Z. So I think that's the way I take uh, Diana's question. Um, sure, sure. I, if, if we're reading it the a wrong way, uh, Diana, please let us know. Um, I, I reached out to a prominent YouTuber uh, the other day, and they didn't know me from a hole in the wall. And I was like, okay, well, how am I going to, you know, how am I going to get their attention? And, and so I just, I kind of went through their Twitter timeline a little bit and, you know, sooner or later came across some unanswered questions that they had posed fairly recently that I could actually answer. And I was like, oh, well, you know, you know, put in a few things, uh, started interacting with them. And then when I DM'd this person, they were like, hey, how you doing? You know, <laughs> and, and, you know, a conversation ensued. And then if I had sent them a LinkedIn request on the back of that, I'm sure they would have acted because they would recognize, oh, that was that rando guy I was talking to on Twitter who gave me some references to, to Java books 
Uh, right, exactly, Nicholas. Yeah, uh, it's the the Reddit rule, right? You know, 80 percent community service, twenty percent self promotion, or whatever it is. Um, exactly. Yeah, one hundred percent. Love that. Thanks, Nick. Uh, next question: Is it always a good route to under promise and over deliver? I believe so. I would rather have less clients. I'm gonna let Peter answer as well. I've kind of jumped in here. <laughs> Um, I would rather have less clients that are happy with me and would always pick me first rather than more clients. And they say, oh, we're only using Eddie because it's just convenient for now. And we can't bother to find anybody else. So I would definitely rather always under promise and over deliver. I don't know if I always, you know, hit that nail on the head. Peter might say otherwise, but I try. That's my goal. I feel if I under promise and over deliver and I miss a little bit for whatever reason, something goes wrong. Um, or I run out of time if there's a deadline, etc. Then I still f hopefully over delivering, and they're still happy with it. What are your thoughts, Peter? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, you certainly can't do any harm. I I wouldn't over rotate on it. I mean, I would just focus on clear communication and, and like what's happening for you and set expectations. Um, you know, sure. If you if you when you're doing that expectation setting, if you want to, you know, notch it a little bit, <laughs> you know, below what you think you're capable of delivering. Sure, you know, absolutely way to delight people. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't over index on it though. I mean, I, it's, I think there's, you know, things are set hard enough and there's enough going on in the world that if you can, you know, if you can just set expectations clearly and be, be transparent about what's happening for you and when, you know, that <laughs> you're already meeting a lot of people. <laughs> right? It's true. That's very true. Oh, I so. see Nick's comment here. I disagree with the idea of under promise. I suppose maybe I should explain a bit more. And Nick, if you could as well. I suppose the reason why I say give a really crude example. A lot of my clients think the length of video is a lot of the value. Peter is, and Denise were very different, which I was quite surprised about. I think I said to them, I do like a five to 15 minute video ended up being, I think about 25 minutes. And Peter said, can you make it, cut this bit out, make it 21, which is very rare. Usually my clients say, well, you said five to 10 and you've done six. I feel I'm getting cheated because I haven't got a few more minutes. So learning from that, what I say is five to 10 and I try and aim for 10, usually hit 11. Still not trying to stretch the video, still adding value to it. Um, and a lot of people think they're getting more bang for their buck, as it as it were. Um, so yeah, I'll be interested to see. Oh, Nick has written. Here we go. Let me bring this up. Agree with Peter. Clear communication is really important. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, clear communication. And I think that goes to what we always say is collaboration first because you need to give context. I think that, again, that's why... I don't know if Peter agrees with this or not, but working with some people when they message me and they say, hey, Eddie, can you, this is a reminder, can you, can you talk at our event? And I'm like, what event? And I'm looking at the history of the chat. There's like nothing there in Discord. I say, oh, I messaged you in Twitter. I'm like, I get like hundreds of messages per day. When was this? You've got a different name on Twitter. Let me try and find it. I spend like 10 minutes trying to find it. And I reply to them and say, look, I can't find it. Can you just remind me? And they say, oh, it's about open source. I said, well, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be about like painting or knitting or driving sports cars. You know, open source is what I do. So I'm pretty sure that's what the event or the talk is going to be on or something around that. Can you give me some kind of date, time, you know, where was the history? And this goes on and I'm getting frustrated now. I'm thinking, look, I'm wasting like 30 minutes on something I don't know if I'm going to do from a person who I don't know. Whereas other people... And they might come back and get annoyed and say, Eddie, I messaged you a week ago. I was like, I've had a thousand messages over the last week. So whereas other people I see, they kind of, I suppose with the communication part that we're talking about, they say, Eddie, I messaged you last week on Twitter. This is a reminder here on Discord. Um, it was about this event. Here's a link. This is the date. This is a talk topic, you know, et cetera, all the information I need. And I go, right. Yes, thank you so much. I can do that or I can't or whatever it is. It's like clear um clear communication hopefully i explained that okay i don't know i kind of went off on a tangent <laughs> I think that was pretty clear yeah okay cool yeah, yeah. Uh, and nick has a point More question um yeah if you under promise and over deliver that can hurt you potentially yes i think you need to kind of 
gauge it, I suppose. Okay, here's a question from Nick, actually. So if you think you can do a 20-minute video for data stacks, but you commit to a 10-minute video, when you negotiate the price, you're negotiating a 10-minute video. It's not on time so much. So that's why it, it's not... We weren't originally negotiating, not that we negotiated, but negotiating on a 10-minute video when I delivered a 20-minute video. So it's not on time. It's more on the result. That's why... Some some clients do see that they do try and you know divide the price by minute, and if they if you they get a bit shorter, they think they've been outdone on price, but it's not quite like that. I probably explain that badly. And I think it's a bit context sensitive too, right? Because you know, Eddie, if we were doing like a a a long form lecture, right on on a particular topic, right? Then yeah, sure, maybe more is better. Right, you know, like a free code camp style, you know, kind of lecture, then sure, maybe more is better. But, you know, if you're trying to introduce something to somebody, maybe, right? And, you know, maybe with the Discord bot example, like I wasn't too bothered, you know, shorter was better because you, what, I think it's that Mark Twain quote, right? It's like, forgive me, I didn't have time to be brief. You know, it's like if you're, if you're, if you're kind of packing it in, in, in more tightly, you know, the audience appreciates that. Right. You know, it's a it's a more effective communication and, you know, not people are going to look at an hour or six hour video or something like that and be like, well, only the people that really, really, really want this topic are going to spend that time. If there's a 15 minute thing, I can gauge whether or not I want to watch six hours on the same topic. Right. So sometimes the shorter videos are, are, are you know, much better, but it depends on your purpose. Right. Uh, you know, th th there's. You know, a, a 15 minute video on, you know, how to code in JavaScript is not going to cut it, right? You can't learn JavaScript in 15 minutes. Sorry. I mean, you can learn a couple things, right? But not all of JavaScript in 15 minutes. That's impossible, right? So, um, yeah, it, it depends on your purpose. It's true. And Nick brings up some really good points about, you know, why uh, commit to time at all? Well, because people like to have a kind of range. They do like to kind of know that it's not going to get a surprise where they have like a 30 second video. Or something like that so and every client is different some i've had some clients say it needs to be minimum of 10 minutes and that's their criteria and i've had other ones where they say maximum of 10 minutes and it doesn't affect the price because it's not on like per minute it's on the result on the value so everyone's kind of different but i like to give a range to give kind of a ballpark but i try to get within that range as much as possible and if they want to cut something out, like again with Peter, it's 26 minutes. Peter said, actually, can we cut this section out? Remove five minutes. Yeah, fine with that. That's not, not a problem. I think it's easier to cut stuff out than it is to add stuff in. Uh, and it's better to set that expectation up front before you lay down the video so that you don't get put in a situation. Because I mean, I've done video editing. It's hard, right? You know, yes. and, and cutting out is usually okay. Usually okay, <laughs> depending on how you've recorded it, right? But like... Yeah, much better to get that alignment up front so that you're not stuck in the position of, of having to figure out how to weld, you know, uh, make a weld, right, in, in your video. True. And Nick says, I wish Radio with Eddie was here. I really want to dive into this. Oh, I would love for you to dive into this. It's so much easier than trying to read the chat because I'm missing some stuff. I've, I see Diana wrote, that's my point. Uh, four different platforms gets confusing. And I can't remember the context. I guess chatting to people on different platforms. I would always recommend trying yeah. to keep to one platform for that person unless they say switch to another one. Like I usually chat to Peter on Discord or Twitter. We don't chat on LinkedIn, although we're connected on LinkedIn. So just try and buy chat to other people on LinkedIn. So just try and keep to one platform for that person, I suppose. Yep. Oh, Nick yeah, that was Diana's question about who to connect to and, and why and where. Yep, you, you absolutely remember the context correctly, Eddie. Yep. Okay, cool. And Nick says, I've misunderstood the question. Okay. Uh, wrong point. If you under promise, you're negotiating the payment for that promise, right? So if then you over deliver all that stuff, you didn't negotiate for payment. 
I just want my client to be super happy, right? Im- imagine if, I don't know, let me th- think of it. I can't think of like a, an example, but if someone, if you're expecting someone to do something and they over deliver, then you're going to be like, oh, I'm going to use that person. They, they over delivered on what I was expecting from them. So that's why I always like to slightly over deliver. I'm not saying spend an extra, you know, twice the amount of time and effort on it. But if you over deliver, you kind of leave, leave them with that warm and fuzzy feeling and they'll want to come back, which is why I have a lot of repeat clients. Hopefully I explained that better. I'm trying to catch up on chat. Sorry. I totally flooded the chat. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll have a chat um, offline or another time on radio, on radio radio or Twitter space. I think that's a really good topic to cover. I like that. Um, I'm just conscious of, yeah. conscious of time. Uh, I've got another couple of minutes. So I'll probably okay. need to wind up about 10 30 ish. No My worries. Time. Anyway, sorry. Nick's saying uh, over delivery shouldn't pre- be pre planned. This is probably better as a discussion on audio. So maybe we'll, it's probably a good safe place to end and uh, we'll we'll pick that up another, another time. Um, I just want to say, Thank you so much, uh, Peter, and and for Denise who was here. Let me share Peter's um, Twitter again. I really appreciate you taking the time to kind of share your experience and knowledge. And let me bring up, I can bring up your details as well again. Yes, share your knowledge and experience. I think it was awesome. Thanks for for having uh, both of us on. Um, funny, uh, this is the most I've seen Denise in the past week or two. So <laughs> that was that was actually awesome. I, I like hanging out with her just as much. So uh, it was a double win and a really pleasure to meet some of the folks here uh, virtually by the chat. Um, yeah, please feel free to reach out um, on Twitter if there's some way we can, you know, some way we can serve you. We'd be happy to help. Um, or, or you can find me in, in Eddie's uh, in Eddie Hub as well. Yes. Um, I see we probably have a, a an invite for that or a, a, a yeah. way to get the Discord. Yep, I can. It's just uh, Discord dot Hub. I'll put it in the chat now. Dot org. No worries, Nick. Perfect. Awesome to have your point of view. You've always got so many great ideas. I think someone made it a bit clearer, actually. I know we were wrapping up, but I did see that where someone said, uh, Alberto, yeah, I think it comes back to clients love quality, good communication, delivery on time. So I suppose over delivery is not just about the final product. That's probably getting too caught up on, on, the, on the focus on the minutes. It's also about the, the documentation and like Denise is not here anymore, but when I sent her my, um, the way I plan my, my projects, my videos, she loved that. Like it wasn't a bullet point list. It was, I can't remember what you call it, but like it's this grid thing where I can put post-its on it in different sections and categories and the storyboard and so on. And, and I remember when Denise received that, she said, oh, wow, I love that, the way you presented that. So again, that's over-delivering. But I do that for myself anyway. So it's just, I'm happy to, to share it with the client rather than bullet points. It's just a bit more visual. So it's not just, I suppose, about the deliver, over-delivering on the final product, but more about... Uh, over delivering the on the whole journey i suppose but yes and again peter thank you so much for being so transparent about you know our working relationship i think it's awesome hopefully it will help the community they give yeah, me, they ask me lots of questions so it's always great to actually bring it here and show them the the real life life version so yeah that's awesome absolutely yeah thanks thanks so much for having me on i appreciate it and uh yeah, if folks want to, to ask more questions or follow up, um, I'll do my best to keep up on, on Eddie Hub um, and engage with you there. So looking awesome. forward to chatting with you. Sounds great. I'm going to bring up the holding page. Peter, if you can hang on for two minutes, I'll bring back to this page, but not on the live stream. Okay, everyone, have a great weekend, and I'm sure we'll geek out with you over the weekend. Remember, open source a day keeps Eddie away. I'm just joking. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>